Is that better? Okay. Um, also, Henrik, thank you for coming all the way from London for this talk. It's a real treat to have you here. You're welcome. This, this is a bit like a real life. You know, I'm over here in London yep. and you're there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, I've been with the magazine for about uh, 13 years. I became the design director uh, in 2015, right before we started on our most recent redesign. Um, and I'm going to talk about that and more specifically about the role of typography in the magazine. But first I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of history about the magazine. This is the first ever cover of the New York Times Magazine. It was published in uh, 1896, so that's about 120 years old. And it was created as a place for literary long-form writing and also for photography. And what you're looking at here are the first photographs ever run in the New York Times. And as you can see, it was initially a broadsheet section of the paper. Uh, we're still distributed in the Sunday paper, and we have about 3.2 million print and digital subscribers. Uh, we make about 52 issues per year. These are all the covers that we've made this year so far. Um, so it's quite a lot of magazines. Um, and we try to be as ambitious as we can every week. So in order to do that, we have to have a pretty large team. Uh, and this is the structure of my art department. Uh, it's seven people, uh, myself. Our art director is Matt Willey. Deputy Art Director Ben Granjanet, and we have one full-time designer right now, Chloe Chef. Uh, and up until recently, we, my department also included Jason Spetko and Franca Gugliero, um, whose work you'll see a lot of up here as well. Um, we have a web designer, Lindsay Fields, um, and we've also been lucky enough to work with a lot of really great freelance uh, contributing designers um, like Deb Bishop, Bishop and Anton Yuknovitz. Um, but so these people are responsible for everything that you see that's designed associated with the magazine, and it's just a super talented group. But we're actually part of a much larger team. Uh, the magazine is headed up by our editor-in-chief, Jake Silverstein, who we feel very lucky to work with, uh, because he's very visually astute and he gives us a ton of freedom, and I'm not just saying that because he's here in the second row. <laughs> We also have a world-class photo department that's headed up by Kathy Ryan, um, just brilliant collaborators. Um, they do amazing work every week. And so, as you can see, it's a lot of people that, that make the work that I'm about to show. We also have copy and research and production teams. So it's about 50 people, um, all told. And we work with a lot of freelance writers and photographers and artists. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the redesign to start off with. Um, the magazine has always been a really well-designed product. Uh, there have been some amazing art directors uh, at the magazine, Janet Froelich, Ron Duplessis, to name a couple. So you might wonder why we would decide to design, redesign the magazine. Um, and there are a number of reasons. We got a new editor, um, Jake King. He had a lot of new ideas about the, what the magazine should be doing. Um, a lot of those were in response to the changing publishing environment. Um, because people are now really getting a lot of their news on their phones. Um, so when they're, when they're reading a magazine, they're looking for a very different experience. They want something that will be more leisurely, possibly something that might entertain them, um, a curated experience. So we were looking to kind of respond to some of these things as well. We also wanted a more cohesive brand identity. Um, we wanted everything to kind of feel like our magazine across platforms. Um, and that becomes more and more important uh, as people are approaching our work through social media. Um, and we wanted, I, we wanted a really hospitable environment for our advertisers, um, because of course, that helps us keep going. Um, so some of the goals of that redesign uh, were to showcase the strengths of the magazine, which are great writing, art, and photography. Um, we wanted to maintain our connection to the times, um, but also distinguish ourselves as a, as a separate group um, within their brand. Um, and we wanted to make the magazine a really covetable, beautiful object that people would want to have. Um, and we were hoping that we would make something unique that would age well over time, that would be grown up, somewhat classic, and have a kind of literary modern feel. Uh, so we started with the basics of the magazine, like the masthead. Um, our masthead has been around a really long time. Uh, it's a very recognizable symbol of the magazine. This is a cover from 1936. Uh, another one from 1942. 1950, so you can see it remains pretty consistent. It changed in 1969, so it's no longer stacked. 
1973, 1991, 1993. This is one of my favorite covers. I just have always thought it took a lot of uh, guts to publish that image. Um, 2001, the logo got smaller. Um, and in 2011, it was no longer centered. Uh, it was moved to the left. Um, so since the logo was so recognizable, we didn't really want to radically change it, but we did want to modernize it a little bit and make it a little more elegant and more geometric. So we worked with Matthew Carter, um, and this is our old logo. Uh, and the logo behind it in blue is the new logo, which is wider and more generously spaced, as you can see. So when you initially look at these things, they don't look that different, but it's when you go up close, uh, that you can see a lot of the changes that we made where we made things a little more geometric, cleaned them up, and had more um, contrast. Uh, and I think the biggest change that we made was to the letter A. Now, we also added um, a, a new informal logo. And this was something that we thought would be a good idea because uh, we wanted something that would work on social media, that would work online, something that um, that while, while our logo is really recognizable, we also found it unwieldy in certain, certain instances. Um, so we wanted to have something that we could use um, you know, on products and in more form, informal situations. So an example of that is you know, on our podcast like on, or on a bag. And as you can imagine, the longer logo wouldn't be anywhere near as graphic. Uh, Another thing that we looked at when we were starting to work on the redesign was definitely typography. The design of the magazine is really stripped down, so um, typography is really our main tool, uh, so it was hugely important. And we wanted to have something that was unique to us, um, and that's, again, particularly important online where you're kind of trying to establish a look that people can come to and understand, like, this is the New York Times magazine. Um, and at the point that we started uh, this redesign, Matt Willey was... Uh, not yet on our team, um, and uh, I had just, he had just agreed to join us from London, um, and he'd done a really beautiful redesign of the British newspaper, The Independent, and uh, had worked with Henrik Kugel <laughs> uh, on the fonts, and also had done a number of other projects with him, had a really great relationship with him, and so uh, while Matt was still in London, we decided that we wanted to commission all new typography um, and work with Henrik. And we thought it was great that Matt was still in London, because he would be able to kind of be really involved and, and go over and look at type specimens and work with him pretty closely. And so the brief that we gave Henrik was that we wanted modern fonts rooted in history. We wanted three distinctly different typefaces uh, that complemented each other. And we didn't want to commission a family of like related fonts, because we felt like that would actually be maybe a little bit too um, comfortable with the magazine that we make. We, we have a lot, of kind of, a lot of different kinds of content. So we didn't want something that felt um, too cohesive, but we did want the fonts to work together. So while we were commissioning all these new fonts for our redesign, we were also thinking about how to maintain our connection to our brand. And uh, <coughs> what you're seeing up here is a layout from the 80s um, that uses a font called Stiney, which is a slab serif that's been in the magazine for decades um, and is really closely associated with our brand. And one of the things that uh, Matt and I were hoping to get out of the, out of the our um, work with Henrik was um, a condensed font, because that's often helpful in getting scale on things and having things feel really immediate. Um, so we asked Henrik to uh, make a, a slab serif condensed font that would, took, took inspiration from Stiney. Uh, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Henrik to talk about the process of making this one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Bravo! Thank you. All right, let's try and get this right. There you go. So this is uh, this is this is uh, my translation of the brief from. Uh, uh, Gail and Matt, and then um, it, it, it's a wild brief to get as a type designer. Uh, get closer to the mic. Oh, I'm so sorry. And so, uh, did you hear the first part? But for me, this, it, this is the, this is a brief translated into into type really. Uh, and as a type designer, it's kind of a it's a wild brief to get uh, because you 
you, it's like you're not just playing uh, one instrument, uh, you're playing many different instruments in the sense that you got a, uh, you got a, um, you have so many different genres of, uh, of parts. And, but that's, that's something I enjoy already. So but it, it, was, it was a brief that finally allowed me to kind of put the, what I practiced for many years, to put that into, 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 the, into make it work really. So it, it's, um, it was um, it's kind of a dream brief and then very, very scary at the same time. But I'll, you, 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 I'll try and explain why it was scary in a few slides. So a lot of the farts, they didn't. They didn't come from nowhere. Just out of you know, they um, they they ha they all have historical references, and and the historical reference for for the um, the serif font is actually a French uh, uh, typeface called Masserin, uh, also known as Astri, and it's a, a Garmong inspired um, typeface. Um, so what I'm showing you here are, are proper printed specimens, and that's what I use as references. In my work, I don't look at digital fonts really. I look at the the old stuff where you can see see how it's made really. Um, the project, all the all the fonts are created for for for, for this uh, magazine is is not a it's not a revival project. Um, it, it's a they they they're all new fonts, but of course they're anchored in history, and a lot of the history comes directly from uh, the New York Times magazine. Uh, one of the fonts is the one we all know as Thymy, also known as Karnak. Uh, beautiful font, and this is um, this is uh, one of my many uh, specimens of this specific font. Um, these are early in the early stages of, of the of the commission and the conversation with with uh, Matt and Gail. Uh, it, we we looked at these books and specimens just to get like a common turn trying to visually agree on where we were going. And you see it to kind of we ended up slightly somewhere else, but it was very important early on that we had like a like a platform that we could take off from. And then um, that's kind of what you're seeing here, like you're seeing the top of the iceberg because of, there are many different references, but these are the core ones. This is a a, a reference uh, for the condensed font, because um, the stymie or Carmack, the, the one we know from from the, the newspaper, it's not, it doesn't exist in this condensed, uh, very heavy condensed. So we, I use some letterpress specimens as, as a reference for that. And I think um, I've, I've, a lot of things has gone on since, but I think actually Matt brought this on the table and said, listen, this is kind of where I want to go visually. Uh, and that just works very well in my head also, because I, I love these things. This is uh, this is uh, showing the uh, American version of uh, Futura called uh, uh, Spartan, and but it, it's um, it's not that we tried to do a new Futura, but we would we were the brief was to do something that was clean and modern and somewhat uh, geometric, and this was a very good uh, starting point for that. And the next slide, I'm going to ask um, Gail to help me, so I don't um, unnamed line. I've got to admit that. But the, this is the, <laughs> this is part of the team that I was working with in, when I was in London and you were here in New York. The, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Jake. There on, on, on the right, <laughs> um, myself, Kathy Ryan, our photo director, Stacy Baker, who is uh, a photo editor, Matt Lilly, um, I, and I think hiding behind the computer is Joanna Milter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could have been me. Yeah. I, I was. Uh, it was a very intense project, and I, I, I basically that, that this is this is. This is kind of similar to the view um, we had in our studio in London because my, my design partner Scott Williams he didn't he didn't see me for like four <laughs> months I was like that I was it was uh, it was intense uh, so the next slide is showing I'm going to show you the, the fonts in detail but but this slide here I think is um, uh, it's actually this line here that's, that's very uh, interesting because it's um, and that's also where where the pressure is for me <laughs> it, it, the magazine is read by four million people. That's a, there's a lot of people looking at your parts. Um, so anyway, I was obviously aware of that. So you uh, uh, but that doesn't, yeah, it's what it's, it's, you know. Just, just imagine that the, yeah. What I'm trying to say is that there was a huge amount of pressure on me, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, I, and I obviously did as 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 uh, I um, I um, I I did my best. Uh, 
and sometimes and, 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 and some, it, it's, it's a weird thing because there's such an intense period of, of drawing fonts that I some when I look back I look at some of the fonts and some and I don't remember doing it. <laughs> and like, and I'm, I'm still looking at it. Anyway, this is a, this is a, this is this is I, I this slide here is basically to say a lot of a lot of it, what we're seeing on in the exhibition is a lot of the um, the openers and the very kind of heavy on on, on typography, but uh, and that's that's a visually a, like a resting. But a lot of pages look like this, where the uh, body copy font is kind of. It's, it's, it's secondary to the the the, um, the article and the, the, the photographs or the illustrations. It's kind of it's in the background, and I, I think that's um, that, that's very nice. I don't mind being the, at the back of the you know just delivering the message and being part of that and, and playing like a you know just um, kind of removed from everything. And, and that, I think that's really where the it does the work. It's a uh, it's. Um, it's nice that it, it has that type of color and it just reads and you don't really think about it. But of course, this is what it's about when you zoom in. So we did uh, two versions of the serif in multiple weights. Uh, the, um, the one for text and one for headlines. So the, uh, the uh, let me get this right. So, so the blue one you're looking at uh, is the one for text. You can see it's, it's more sturdy. The X height is, is increased and the cap height is decreased. Uh, it's um, uh, slightly less contrast and um, uh, more open counters, and obviously the red is uh, the opposite. It's, uh, it's taller. Uh, the X height I made that smaller because it's thought it'd give it more grace, and it's, it's very refined and and uh, and uh, with, with high contrast. And this slide here is kind of a, is 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 showing the um, the headline font and and some of the calligraphic. Uh, details that I put into this font is, is a direct reference to the New York Times magazine mass set, so like the black letter sharpness. There was, it's a subtle reference, uh, but I felt that there was a, it was something that we could definitely use in the font, and that's why it looked like that. Because you, you, you look at it and you don't, it just feels right, but it feels right because it linked to the mass set. So now you know. <laughs> this is just one of my, this is one, one of the very early covers, and uh, When you draw type, it, it's and you see it used in you know in outside in the real world. That that's that's one thing. But seeing your font on the New York Times magazine cover, that's a whole different ballgame for me personally. So I'm just uh, I'm incredibly humbled and proud uh, to to be able to you know just it's a, well thank you. It's a, it's a, but it's also a very nice piece of. Uh, magazine design. So now I'm going to show you uh, j just a bit of zoom in a bit on the type and just show you uh, so we can appreciate the letters themselves. Uh, I don't actually get to work with these fonts. I, I, I drew them and then I handed them over, handed them over my babies to a very capable team. Uh, and uh, I'm just uh, very pleased to see what comes out on the other end. It's, 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 it's wild and I'm, I'm constantly surprised. Uh, but this is this is a, this is this is what I saw. Uh, so this is the display version um, that's used in very large point sizes. Um, this is the condensed slab. So all these fonts are in many different weights. And this is the version that's very thin. This is not. <laughs> this is an example of how our relationship has continued. So. The, the black uh, cap H we're looking at here was the, was the font I delivered uh, as part of the redesign, and that's what was commissioned and approved. But, and I was in London on the, on the day of the, of the launch of the, the, the redesign, and, and I stayed for a couple of days, and I think the day after the launch, uh, Matt called me up and said, Henry, I'm, I, think, I think the black needs to be a bit taller. I'd like to see it. I said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So. I was still in, in the in the job, uh, and so I did the one called Black Tower, uh, and then just just a couple of letters, and then then uh, 
like I think the day after or even half a day after Matt called me again and said can you be a little bit taller so now there's actually three versions of the uh, this this slab uh, condensed which has gone even more condensed which is it's very interesting uh, and and uh, and a nice way to work uh, I, I like to think that the um, you know Obviously, I don't like other people working on my fonts, but I love the fact that the client understands that these are, although it's their fonts, they're also my fonts in a way. They're my babies, and I I, I gave birth to them. It means I know them very, very well. So if things like this comes along, I'm the right guy to do it. And I really appreciate that. It's the, it's the, it's the right way uh, to work between a client and a type designer uh, in my mind. Uh, this is just to show how these are a couple of my favorite covers. Uh, just showing this and then a, a, a few close-ups. Just to see this. It, this is where 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 the type actually um, is in the background and, and the illustration is in the foreground. And and one thing I think uh, is very very important and something that maybe something I only just learned to is like a. Um, the magazine is incredibly good at commissioning illustration and photography, as well as writing, of course. But all the visuals we're looking at, they're, they're, you've got to have a lot of skills to get the right illustration. We look at it, and it makes perfect sense. But the, the craft that goes into commissioning the right illustrator and putting the right idea on the cover, it, it's, just, it's, a, it's enormous, but it's hidden. But I just want to highlight this one, which I think is absolutely beautiful. And, it, and it's a great the combination of illustration and type. Um, it's just zooming in on one of the uh, uh, spreads that's early on in the magazine. And this is another uh, one of my favorite spreads. I think it was in the in the in the launch issue. And you got to be good to commission illustration that works with type that way. You, you, it it just comes together. And so this is. I picked this to celebrate the illustration and also the people who commissioned the illustration and also to the type designer or, or the, the typographer who put it together. I think it's a, it, the, all these building blocks coming together is just incredible and it gives us a, a, like a visual that we, it's just, it's lovely. This is one of my favorite covers, absolutely favorite. And, um, <laughs> Well, I just see a type specimen. I don't know what you're seeing, but this is what I'm seeing. And it's just like, this is incredible. I mean, I can retire on this. This is enough for me. It really is. I, I, and, and, and I'm unsure who designed it, uh, but I th you know, the, the team. But I think it's a. Thank you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm nearly there. I'm just going to go through uh, the, the sands and then uh, a, a couple of slides of the serif also and some of the extra fonts we've been doing. So, so the, the G, uh, I spend a lot of time on all the glyphs in the, in the fonts, but the, this G I spend extra time on. I could not get it right. It wasn't until I made it, gave it that little sharp bit at the very end of the G that it kind of like the rest, and then move on to kind of the rest. So this is just uh, one of the, uh, I think this is the bold weight of the sands we drew, uh, and and the red, the two red letters are alternate. Uh, they are, so the, the default set is the, the single story, and, and the, I come, to, uh, I, Gail's favorite is the single story, that's why it's the default, and then my favorite is the red, I like double story A's, but that's what they brought me. But uh, I've seen them used, so it's not there. It's in the font. There's a lot of hidden things in the font. And I, I'm, when I sometimes get the magazine and I see see the, the designers of the magazine been finding those details, I put in the font and those extra glyphs. And I just like thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a, a one of my favorite covers. Also, uh, the, the sands uh, and. And the illustration pick, it's like it, it, it just it just comes together. It, it works. So this is exactly how the illustration, uh, this is you know how it should it, it just fits the font. And I, and I think it's a, it's very it's, it's fun and it's 
in this immediate and it, and and, and it's just uh, they, they complement each other. Uh, the simplicity of it. It's like a, these co many of these covers are posters, like typographic posters. And if there's something I like, this typographic posters. <laughs> <laughs> this is a small overview of the uh, of the serif fonts. Uh, it's very small on my screen, so I'm going to look here. So it's, it's the body copy uh, fonts we have in the italics, and it's in, I think it's in five or ten so it's, 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 it's big. This is a bit more just to show you show the palette together. Uh, uh, I it's been added to since the job uh, launched or the, the the redesign launch. So I've been adding like a an extra display to the serif, and I've been adding obviously the condensed fonts. But also, you if we're looking at the uh, the sans serif, uh, the first delivery uh, and the commission was to do just the the Roman weights. A couple of months later, I added uh, italics for all all that, like proper drawn italics, and the the sans bold we see with with serif now. It was um, something we we I was commissioned to do like a a, a headline sans. Uh, I'm not sure if it's been used that yet, but I, I I I put it in because I think it has some quality. Anyway, I'm nearly there. The relationship is ongoing, and I love it. And this was a, another chance where I, I could kind of look at what I've done and just tweak it a little. Not, not tweak it, but um, add more to it. And I was I was uh, I was asked to do um, a stencil version of the serif, uh, which I did. So the, the palette of fonts is just continuing, but also in, in a natural way. And I'm not sure how the next slide is going to work, but um, this is a this is. I gave a talk in uh, in Tokyo uh, a while ago, and that was before uh, your president was elected, the person that you have now. And I put this in at the end of my talk, not knowing what was going to happen. So, well, here we are. And now I'll hand it over to Gail. Thank you. to talk a little bit about that collaboration with Hendrik. Hendrik um, this is one of the markups that, uh, that Matt and I gave Hendrik as we were working with him. Um, I think this was, collaboration was really successful and, and um, I think it was successful in that uh, Matt and I were able to guide the process to get what we wanted in terms of what we, how we thought we would design the magazine and just what we needed for the brand. Um, but Henrik was also, he was very receptive to our thoughts and our feedback, but he also pushed back at times when he felt like we were making a request that was going to um, compromise the font in some way or possibly make it too close to another font or make it less interesting. And so we were relying on his judgment uh, and that kind of combination to make it work. There was a lot of give and take, um, and I think it was a good collaboration. Um, there was one time where I remember uh, telling him something, Henrik was very, nice to work with and he always signs off his emails with a little smiley face. There was one time after after we <laughs> talked that there was no smiley face on, on the email. I, I think it was when I told him that he'd given us a, a weight of the font that we didn't ask for and I think he had spent maybe two, three days on it uh, and, and uh, he, didn't, he didn't like that. <laughs> but I mean, I want to also say that this project happened um, over such an incredibly tight time frame that he was working so hard, I mean, kind of day and night for, I don't know how many months. Uh, a long time and many hours. So when, when you when you, <laughs> draw that, when you draw that extra weight that wasn't commissioned, it's kind of, you haven't got three days, you know, so it, I was not happy. He came back, he was very cheerful the next time I talked to him, it was just that one email. <laughs> and we picked it up the day after. Yes, we did. It was a, it was a, it was, a, it was good. Though. It was a knockout. Okay. Well, so, <laughs> so now I'm going to show you how uh, just a little film of how the font is used in the magazine from week to week.
kinds of fonts that we commission from Henrik. The magazine tends to experiment quite a lot um, typographically. Um, and as Henrik mentioned, our relationship with him has been really a big part of that. He's become a really frequent collaborator with us. Um, Henrik mentioned that he had drawn like, two additional uh, uh, condensed slab serifs that were, that were taller for us. This is actually um, a, a one-off where he drew a super tall version of that for this layout. Um, so we've done a lot of um, kind of special projects with him like that. Um, and often he makes things for us for special issues, and we end up liking them so much that we just kind of incorporate it into the language of the magazine. Like, for example, this uh, uh, this font, which was commissioned for the cancer issue, which is, is a stencil version of our serif font. And we've also used some of Henrik's fonts in conjunction with our own fonts and some of our layouts. Uh, for example, uh, this is uh, a combination of Henrik's new, new grotesque and our own fan serif. We also do collaborate with other designers and illustrators. Um, this is a, a cover that we did with Jessica Walsh. Um, we often do uh, covers that, that use imagery or use typography as imagery. Um, it's one of the things I love to do. Uh, this is another one uh, done by Sean Freeman. And this image was actually done before, before Brexit, so it was Russian, done in 2015. Um, a lot of designers in our group make their own fonts or bespoke typography. Uh, Matt Willey makes a lot of his own fonts and works with those quite a bit. Uh, ben, our deputy art director, has been making more and more bespoke type treatments. Um, so yeah, I, I think almost everybody in some form makes, makes their own typography. And here's some examples of that. Uh, and now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our special issues. Um, these are some of our most ambitious projects. Um, and they're cases where we really look at changing up the magazine and redesigning it. We often are using new fonts that we consider a different grid. Um, and we're looking at the magazine as, uh, instead, of, instead of looking at it as um, four stories that can be designed in a, in a similar way, um, or as a unit, um, we are often thinking about the magazine as a container for a more varied story and thinking about non-traditional structures. Uh, that we can use in, in the magazine. And so this is our 2016 music is issue. Um, and it used a list of 25 songs as entry points uh, to talk about what's happening in music today. And it had a really distinctive typographic identity. Uh, and this was actually um, made, the idea was to base it on um, gig posters. Um, and so it had all different weights and thicknesses of one of Kendrick's songs, uh, New Grotesque Grounded. So can I so this font, is, it actually exists in seven different widths. So I, when this came back, I was like, wow. Yeah. They, yeah. Just, they didn't use it just a single font. They mix, it, it was Jason doing it. Yeah. They, they're just mixing it up, making it was kind of a, I had never imagined that myself. So that was a very pleasant surprise. Was this uh, a team effort? Was this a team effort? Because I was looking for Oh, yeah. Uh, well, how do you mean? Like each of the issue, each of our special issues is headed up by one of our designers, um, and then everybody on the team kind of helps them pitch in to kind of execute this thing um, at the end, at, in the final ship week. Yeah. So here's how it's played out throughout. Um, and we often extend the look of our special issues to the online treatments. Um, so this is how the music issue issue looked in digital form. obviously because it's music to a digital treatment. Um, and then we also did, um, a lot of our issues are recurring, so we did another music issue in 2017 which had the same premise. So it's just kind of an example of us reapproaching the same problem and treating it in a different way. I like this type treatment quite a bit. Uh, it was a, a custom type by Henrik on 25, and then we worked with an illustrator, Braulio Amato, to make the lettering. 
and on the inside it was a kind of combination of both overlay, which uh, this was Jason again, um, but we uh, we liked that it had a certain boldness and irreverence. Uh, and this is our the most extensive redesign we've ever done of the magazine um, for a special <coughs> issue. It's our New York issue. Uh, the theme was life above 800 feet. It had a fold-out cover. And it was flipped 90 degrees the entire issue to make use of the tallest dimension of the magazine. Um, so, and we did that to create a vertical, vertical format to help show off New York's super tall buildings. Um, and photography was specially commissioned for that. Uh, and uh, the type was specially drawn for that, drawn by Matt. This is an example of that. Uh, a map of all the buildings in Manhattan, Manhattan over 800 feet tall. What's that? Was it published? Yes, this was published. I uh, can't remember the date on this, but. June 5th, 2016. Yeah, June 5th, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to mention that um, this was a really close collaboration with our editorial team. Matt was going back and forth, um, talking to our editors, basically saying, like, can you. I need, you know, a few less letters, can you rewrite this headline, you know, can you fit this in this space? Um, and they really um, collaborated with us to do that, which was great. Um, and in, in a lot of instances, the type is pretty much illegible. Um, and we were okay with that because it, it illustrates a point. It's almost functioning more as a graphic here. Um, and all of the, uh, the whole idea of the article is actually contained in the deck. So. Uh, it really was more of a graphic element in a way. I think this is the biggest type we've ever published <laughs> in any magazine. Uh, and I mentioned that we uh, flipped the magazine to be vertical so that we could show off the you know, super tall buildings of New York, but um, I really love this spread, uh, which is in the middle of the issue. When you come to it, I think it has a lot of power. It's a that you get to see a basically larger than life portrait of a construction worker right in the middle of all this is, is pretty great. And I wanted to mention that the entire issue, even even the the ads and uh, the crosswords were turned, uh, the whole thing. And it was pretty well received. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we knew we would get some criticism from this, uh, but we still felt it was worth doing. It's one of 52. And we like to experiment. Uh, and so it would go back the next week, we figured. <laughs> and this is how it looked online. cover of our, um, our lives issue in 2016. It's something that we do every year in December. Uh, we publish a mag an issue of the magazine that celebrates the lives of the people that, that have passed away in that year. I thought this one had a particularly nice um, typographic identity. Uh, and uh, Jason, the designer that worked on this, he worked with uh, Christina Bartsova, who designed this font. Um, it's called Sestra. And uh, he commissioned a bunch of ligatures and special characters for it um, to be used in this issue. issue with the theme of big food. Uh, and uh, we commissioned some hand lettering from John Downer uh, to reference supermarket flyers. And we also commissioned some special stickers like the ones found on fruit and vegetables um, just to convey the information that's usually considered like the page furniture uh, on the page. Things like the date, the type of issue. Um, and we made these things into design elements. So there's a lot of nice typography in these little details. Um, and these were designed by Dan Saro. Uh, and the issue is based around a, a photo essay that George Steinmetz proposed to uh, Kathy Ryan, our photo director. So uh, there were these amazing kind of um, monumental images of large quantities of food being farmed and packaged uh, in between um, the stories. So they were kind of their own story, and then and they didn't relate specifically to the writing. Um, but then the stories, uh, the story I think just looked like this. This is our annual uh, 
photographic voyages issue. It's a project that our photo department heads up, where they ask photographers to take a trip that they've always wanted to take uh, and ask them to document their journeys. Um, and this is the opener to the package and the opener to the essay. Um, so we have a couple of type typographic moments, um, but uh, when we get into the feature well, the typography really kind of lays back and lets the artwork come out. And that's something that we're talking a lot about at the magazine all the time, just what kind of typography is totally right for each piece? What should the relationship be between art and the design and the imagery? Um, and we have a lot of discussions about that. Uh, we're not always on the same page, <laughs> but I think we come out in the right place usually. This is the cancer issue that I think Henrik already showed the cover of. A couple spreads from that. Uh, and our recent health issue, which we thought was a nice break from all the Trump coverage. Uh, it was <laughs> about what animals are, are teaching us about human health. Um, and we had two versions of this cover. Uh, uh, one for cat lovers and one for dog lovers. <laughs> the opener to the, the feature well. Uh, and uh, this was a design done by Chloe. She'd drawn drop caps to resemble parts of animals, which was very, I think, very graphic and unique. Uh, this is an issue that we published last August uh, that we're really proud of. It, it was devoted to a 140,000 word story, and it was the history of Arab Spring told through the eyes of six people whose lives it affected, and uh, it was the result of 18 months of reporting by Scott Anderson, uh, and it had photos by Paolo Pellegrin that were shot specifically for the magazine for this issue, but it also drew on 20 years of his um, archive shooting in that region, um, and it was talked about in, in at the magazine before it was published like a book, uh, and then uh, designed to read like a book. Uh, and. We actually got um, funding from the Pulitzer Center. So we were able to get rid of all the ads, so we were able to have this nice wraparound cover. Uh, and then I'm going to show you uh, the first, I think, few pages in order. because, And when I show them to you, I want you to kind of think about what a magazine normally looks like when you're looking through it, which is kind of chaotic. There's a bunch of ads, you know, and content mixed in. But this was very clean and stripped down, and uh, I think really appropriate. To, uh, to this very serious topic and gave it a lot of stature. That's the only ad there on the left. Um, and then uh, Matt designed this and he made, uh, he did something really nice with our, our stands, I feel like just a very, very stripped down kind of design that puts a lot of the emphasis on, on the words. And so you can see in the pages, there are none of the typical enticements that you usually have in magazines, like drop caps or pull quotes, these kind of things that are meant to kind of pull you through the layout. Um, so we just, it was just kind of rigidly formatted and focused on the writing. It's a very different issue. <laughs> um, it's our 2015 culture issue, uh, and the theme was the self. And uh, it's the design is based on a mashup of two fonts, Bradley Poe, Pro and Boeing, which is one of Hendrix's fonts. Um, and the idea was to get at multiple versions of the self through this uh, type treatment. I've been showing you a lot of finished typography, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the process, which is often not a straight line. Um, sometimes when we're working on an issue, we pick out you know a couple different fonts and test them out you know against the photos and kind of see what we can come up with. For this past year's culture issue, um, Matt wanted to try something with stamps, so he took a font that he had designed, made it into stamps, uh, spent a huge amount of time stamping and uh, scanning in letters, and he made some layouts with it that we really loved. Um, but then, as we were talking about it, we really couldn't figure out a reason why this type should look like good type or have this texture. Uh, so we eventually just kind of we eventually decided to use the font, but scrap the stamps. Um, and so we used the type uh, and, and kind of strong vibrating colors to give the identity of issue identity. I don't think you've seen the last of those stamps, though. We're hoping to, <laughs> hoping to make use of them. 
Uh, and I'm going to end on a project that is not a type project. I've talked a lot about type, but and it's definitely a very important part of what we do, but it's also only a portion of it. Um, and I mentioned the visual look of the magazine is really based on the relationship between type and image. Uh, so I'm going to end up showing one of our most ambitious photo projects. Uh, in September of 2015, we published a themed issue on walking in New York. And uh, our photo department commissioned JR, a French artist who makes large scale paintings in urban areas, to paste a walking figure down on a, the Flatiron Plaza in Manhattan. And so they started at 4 a.m., pasted down 62 strips of paper uh, to make a 150 foot image. And then uh, when the shadows were right, uh, JR flew overhead in a helicopter and shot a picture of this. And uh, th so there were some interesting ties into JR's work. The, the person that he pasted down in the plaza was an immigrant, um, and that kind of tied in with some of the work that he was doing and the idea of unseen immigrants. And we thought it was very poetic that, um, you know, a lot of these people, when they were walking over this image, because they were so up close to it, it was really just texture to them. So they were kind of unaware that they were walking over this, this image of a walking person, and definitely unaware that it was being photographed for, for a cover. So this all happened over the course of a day. And then it was uninstalled at 9 p.m. with the power washer. There's some shots from the ground. Kathy again. And that's the cover. or a photograph or something conceptual, so we're usually pretty quick to agree on that. Um, 
you know, in the end, our, our editor in chief, Jake, has the final say on what these things should be. So if there is a disagreement, we will, you know, defer to him. But he's very good about listening to, you know, both sides of the story and or kind of taking into account everything that people are saying um, and making a judgment based on that. Um, but in, in terms of like any conflicts about like layouts or uh, kind of photo choices, that's we work very closely together. So. We're often um, in agreement on a lot of this stuff. Um, other times, you know, when we're not in agreement, we'll uh, we'll have several rounds of discussion about what it should be. Um, and in the end, if we you know don't come to a conclusion, often Jake will have you know he will have an opinion about which way it should go, and that's that's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I I found that the process is really a good one. Everyone you know is able to make their arguments and I think that's one of the things that makes the magazine good is that everyone is able to kind of bring their point of view to it um, and oftentimes I'll hear Kathy talk about a photo and you know not have seen the thing in it that she saw you know and so it, it sometimes I she I just change my mind from listening to her um, and so I think it's, it's a really rich way to work to just have a lot of conversations surrounding these things um, and yeah I think you know that's it's a really healthy way to make a magazine. Yeah? Do you ever get feedback from readers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we get we get a lot of feedback from readers. Um, I don't think I get all of it. Jake probably gets a lot of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We get a fair amount. Uh, About the design? Like yeah, yeah. We usually hear from them when type is too small. <laughs> a lot of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, we get a lot of feedback. We got a lot of really good feedback about our recent New York issue that was an all comics issue. A lot of people that were it was you know both ways on the uh, on the New York issue that was turned. Um, you know some some of the more um, maybe controversial things that we have done have you know received a lot of a lot of commenting. So it tells you that people are engaged with the thing that you make. Yeah. From an art perspective, are the same groups handling the print and the digital products? So um, we have a digital designer um, who works closely with um, our print designers and and you know helps to make the, the layouts for these special issues. Um, you saw an example that like the Trump uh, the Trump layout on the um, the digital Trump layout was is basically an example of a more formatted version of our story that goes up online, so there's not a lot of like collaboration on that. But it's really these like special issues that we do where we all get together and uh, you know talk about how it should look or you know kind of the our digital designer works with a language that has been created by one of our designers for the special issue. Um, so that's pretty collaborative and all comes out of the group. Yeah. How does your team think about color? Is there any overarching philosophy to the spreads? I don't think so. I think I think oh, we we often like black and white, <laughs> or else really colored. Uh, but yeah, we don't. I don't think we have. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I can't think of a particular like color idea that we have. We don't tend to use pastels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that uh, font, do you guys have specific brand guidelines that you that you adhere to? You have to adhere to, or do you just push the envelope and think out of the box? We don't have specific brand guidelines that we adhere to, but I think we all have a pretty good sense of what the magazine should be. Um, and so, you know, and we, and I think everyone kind of designed somewhat within that that mindset of of that. But I also think that it's good to push out of that sometimes, uh, which we also do. But only to, only if there's reason, you know, only if the kind of content or subject warrants it. Um, to to kind of keep things fresh. Um, you know, we try to be as original as we can. Yeah? Um, you mentioned that there is, like, the diversity of content kind of drove the creative breeze for picking different the families for three different typefaces. How do you select them for the articles that based on layout, based on content, based on the message? Like, how do you know if you're going to use Sarah for this one or Slap for that one? Yeah, that's something that we often, each individual designer, um, tries out, you know, um, 
and I think it becomes pretty clear as we look at the layouts. Oftentimes, it's a matter of um, you know how the design is working. Some of the fonts are good at a larger scale, some smaller. Um, they each definitely have their own feel, but I think it's something that uh, is resolved um, kind of through through making things. Do you find yourself having to defend the expense of this amount of customization or design at the time? No, uh, I think that, you know, we had to um, think pretty hard about how we spent our money on the redesign. Um, and uh, this is most of, you know, where it went was to these fonts. I think that they are fonts that we, you know, might intend to use for quite some time. But um, no, the Times hasn't uh, had a problem with the way that we're handling our budgets. There's support. Yes? Who designed the numbers and the numbers? Who designed the numbers? Who designed the numbers and the money issue? Ben Grandinet? Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh. Thank you.